Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Again, I really uh, appreciate the opportunity uh, to share some studies with you guys that uh, that I find relevant. That's how my my lessons always begin with what what God's showing me about things, and then sometimes it resonates and goes, "Hey, this is maybe going to be helpful if I share this also." So that's. Uh, kind of what prompted uh, this lesson this morning. So I'd like to invite you to turn in your New Testaments to Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, that's what I'm going to start with this morning. And uh, the topic that I want to talk about a little bit and just want us to consider together this morning is uh, what does it mean to have Jesus Christ as the head of the church? And what I mean by that is not you know, a theological image of, you know, we, we could all kind of remember a chart somewhere that we've seen where, you know, Jesus is on his throne in majesty somewhere way up there far away and, and the church is, is here and we go, that's what it means. But that doesn't really help me uh, from day to day uh, to, to have that image. I mean, I need to know as one of the shepherds here, and I'm going to presume to represent uh, all of leadership, our, our elders, our deacons, and all of you guys who are involved and invested in uh, the work here, is that, that we need to know how Jesus leads this church. Uh, you know, we're in, we're in some times where we're considering things, we're trying to figure out what does God want us to do moving forward, uh, how does God want us to serve, you know, our world, our culture, our communities, and, and we need the leadership of Jesus in that. So we, I just want to talk a little bit about this morning and just suggest some things that we might think about. I don't say that I have all the answers, but uh, I definitely want to... Uh, take the time this morning to consider these things. So uh, in Ephesians chapter 1, this is a, a, a much read passage, but it's Paul uh, expressing his appreciation and his prayer for the brothers and sisters at Ephesus. And this very well, like uh, as you guys probably know, uh, the, the letter to the Ephesians might have been a circular. It might have been a, a letter that was addressed to Ephesus with the intention of it getting passed along to all the churches of Asia. And so I think that really explains uh, some of, you know, the way that Paul wrote this letter. And he said, therefore, I also, verse 15, therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenlies, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. A lot going on in that short passage. But it culminates in the idea that, that Paul's desire is for the exalted Christ to be recognized as head over his people and that his people are tuned in to his lead, tuned in to the power that he wants to work through his body, the church. And at, at risk of being uh, redundant, I know that, that uh, I probably 
talk about this a lot, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because you guys are going to go, hey, isn't that what you preached about last time? Um, <clears throat> but that is the, when we look at, when we look at God's overall purpose for, for his people, his overall purpose for, for humanity, it starts obviously in Genesis 1, right, where God says, let us make man in our image, that they might bear our image, that they might be stewards and give them dominion over the creation. So, so God has this, this glorious plan for, for this human race, this, this people who have a spirit incorporated into a flesh and, and, and gives us a glorious vocation to represent him into humanity and to be the ones who, in a sense, channel all of the, all of the worship that, that innate creation and animal creation and so forth, all of the worship and praise that they owe to God channels through this race of people who can actually praise God from the heart, from the spirit, connect with God. So all of creation can connect with God through humanity. And, and he gives us this vocation. And then we read the tragedy part where where the sin comes in and, and, and this whole plan of God, this whole purpose of God for us is compromised by sin. So then God begins forming this special people. And I would have to apologize to David Scott if I was looking at him right now because he doesn't like me to bring up Israel in this story. But Israel is the people that God begins to form through Abraham and he's going to form a people because now he has through Jesus, through his foreknowledge of Jesus coming, he has, he has made it possible for faith to be reckoned as righteousness. So in a sense, he has, he has solved the sin problem, although it's not done yet in history. In Abraham, his faith was counted as righteousness. And so with Abraham, he begins forming a nation that can now be his representative people, that can lead the other nations back to him. And then we see that the Israel experience is compromised by sin and they end up in captivity. So then the very word of God, the word who is with God, the word who was God in the beginning, that word of God becomes flesh. That word of God takes on the seed of Abraham and becomes a human being. And he demonstrates to us the perfect example of what humanity was meant to be. He, he, he walks in the life of the Father. He walks in step with the Father. He demonstrates what God's image looks like in human form. And he shows us the perfect man. He shows us what Adam was designed to be. He shows us what Israel was designed to be. And through his death, burial, and resurrection, he expands that possibility to include all those who believe in him, all those who are reborn in him. Because we can look at Jesus and go, okay, so one person, you know, even God had to come and do it himself. And so one person pulls it off. So how does that rescue God's big plan, his eternal purpose? One God. In John chapter 12, Jesus said, if a grain of wheat doesn't fall into the ground and die, it remains alone. One God. But if it dies, if it dies, it brings forth a harvest. It brings forth a harvest of grain. God makes it possible through the sacrifice of Christ, as we've just celebrated that. God makes it possible for this same capacity, this same image-bearing power and stewardship and righteousness to dwell within every person who comes to Christ. And, he, and as it was mentioned, he wants everybody to come to Christ. He wants to rescue all of us back into his purpose. And so then we, we find that this group that's called the church, this group that's called the new Israel, this group that's called the new humanity, is now under the headship of the one who makes it all possible. And it's a living organism. It's not an organization. Jesus didn't come to form some religious organization. He came to, to, he, he came to create a body to expand his body. You know, if we were walking around in those days when Jesus was on earth, we could say, where's Jesus? 
Oh, he's over in Capernaum. Oh, you know what? He sailed across. He's, he's over there in Decapolis feeding 5,000. So if you guys want to hang out, if you don't want to walk all the way around or you don't have time, you, you'll just have to wait because he'll be back here at some point. Where is he? Well, he's in one place, but, but not, no longer. No longer. Now, when we talk about Jesus, when we talk about his body, it's wherever there are believers is where Jesus is. He, he's God with us. And, and so he's expanded this idea of his body from being just that one body that he possessed to being a corporate living organism of people that form the body of Christ. And so then that leads us to the question then, because we have this weird situation, right? It's a weird situation. Is that our head is in the heavenlies at the right hand of God, but his body, the ones who aren't with him, his body that's still biologically alive, is here living in a broken world. So the head's in heaven somewhere and the body's on earth. And where's the communication? What, how, how does that work? Now we could have Neil come up and explain to us. We could have him, he could take probably the next couple of years and explain to us all the, the nuances of how this head right here, as empty as it is sometimes, can control this body and all the central nervous system and all the stuff that has to happen for the head and the body to communicate and walk in some kind of unity, right? And, and that, I mean, that's a wonderful thing. And, and I want you guys to just think about that's what Jesus does with his body. Jesus, the head, is connected to the organism of his body. And so as the body of Christ is functioning in a broken world, we need to know what, what's the head thinking? What, what is he directing us to do if we're going to succeed in doing what he wants us to do? Uh, in John chapter 17, I'm going to read a verse over there that's a mind blower. <clears throat> John chapter 17 is, is Jesus' prayer to the Father just before he goes to the cross. He says in verse 20, he, this, he were kind of coming in in the middle of his prayer. But he's been praying for those who are right there with him. And now he extends that prayer out to us, to those of us who are in this room today. This prayer is extended out this far. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. What does he pray? What does he want? He's praying for us. He's praying for us who have believed through the word of those who were with him at the time. That they all may be one. What does that look like? Well, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world might believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me I have given them that they may be one just as we are. I in them and you in me that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Explain that. I in them, you in me, us in them. The Father and the Son take up residence in the body by the power of the Holy Spirit. What, what's going on here? It's Jesus praying for and, and assuring us that his position at the right hand of God is not in any way going to break down the intimacy and the, the connectedness between he and his people. Now, I, don't, I can't say, hey, yeah, I understand that. It's like, what? There's a lot of indwelling going on right there. How does that work? Well, I don't know how to explain it. But I think the challenge is, is how do we live it? How do we put it into practice? How do we actually walk in that 
to fulfill the plan and the, the prayer that Jesus has for us. So as we uh, talk about this a little bit this morning, I just wanted to, to, you know, just to emphasize that when we talk about the body of Christ, and I know that, you know, we are a, uh, a restoration. Uh, we, we say, you know, the, the restoration movement uh, is a lot of our heritage here, you know, and, and there's a lot of great things. I mean, getting back to the simplicity of the Bible is, is amazing, you know, and I totally thank God that that's my background as far as biblical training. But I think sometimes, at least for me, sometimes I looked at it like if we can kind of restore some outward structure, that that's what God wants in, in restoration. But what God, it's an organism. It's not a car. You know, a 57 Chevy, if I could restore it back to factory showroom condition where all the numbers matched and stuff, it would still be a 57 Chevy and it might as well be 1957. But there is 2022, and we're coming out of two years of upheaval, and who knows how much longer it's going to go on. We've got issues that are going on. We can't be a 57 Chevy in, in function. We have to put some kind of disc brakes at least, right? I mean, we need something. <laughs> we got to stop. People don't drive like they did back then. <laughs> what my point is is that, that for the church to succeed and function, we need to look at ourselves as a living organism, taking orders that, that our head, who is at the right hand of God, wants us to know in 2022, Southern California muscling through another brutal February. That was a joke. <laughs> so how does the head lead the body? Well, I want to suggest three ways that we can think about the first one is the obvious one and that is the scriptures right the scripture god leads the body or jesus leads the body through the scriptures we understand from second timothy 3 that the scriptures are inspired of god they're brief god's breath it's the scriptures are god breathing out information and so the scriptures are inspired of God. They're profitable for instruction, for reproof, for correction, for righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Right? God gives us everything pertaining to life and godliness in the scriptures. We learn that. We know that. And I love that about my heritage in the Restoration Churches, right? Is, is that the idea that the scripture is that important. It's that critical that I that I understand it and I, I'm still growing in it. Hebrews 4.12 says that the word is alive. It's a living word by his spirit, right? It's living. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. So as we look at our Bibles, we see our Old Testament. Our Old Testament is, is revealing the purpose of God. It's revealing an eternal purpose that God began with before time began. God had an eternal purpose. And the Old Testament begins to reveal that purpose of God as it moves towards its fulfillment in Christ. And so as we're getting closer and closer to Jesus, as we read through our Old Testament, we're learning more and more that's pointing us to him. Then we get to the Gospels. And as we read our Gospels, it's showing the purpose of God being lived out through Jesus. Jesus has come, as I said earlier, that he has come as this, the perfect, exi uh, excuse me, the perfect example of what God has designed humanity to be. We see, we see his purpose being lived out day to day, as Rick pointed out, as we look at Jesus traveling around, the things that he said, the things that his compassion the way that he made decisions, the way that he always stayed in step with the Father, we see that being lived out in Jesus as we read our Gospels. And then we get to our book of Acts as Frank and Neil have been guiding us through this trimester. And Acts is recording the purpose of God now being lived out in the body of Christ. Now the purpose of God... The things that Jesus began to both do and teach in the gospel are now being continued 
through the body. So now we see a collective body. We see the body of Christ that we've been talking about. And the body of Christ is living out the purpose of God through the same indwelling life that Jesus lived by. The same life that, that Jesus said, I can do nothing except what I see my Father doing. I can, I can say nothing except what the words that the Father has given me to say. We see that same life principle now being exercised by a collective group, the body of Christ. And then we get to the epistles, and the, the epistles are revealing the purpose of God also. And that is in the person of Jesus coming through these apostles, instructions are being written to churches and individuals. And there's all kinds of different specific situations that, that are going on that the epistles address. But I think in all of those, God in his wisdom has given us enough of a sampling of humanity and the way that God's word applies to these situations. He's given us those principles that whatever might come up, we have some biblical foundation and principle of how do we deal with this by the instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ. What, what, would, what would Jesus say to them? What is Jesus saying to them through his word? And we have that. So in scripture, we have this inspired kind of a, an inspired standard of measurement, right? An inspired measuring tool, uh, a measure of faith, a measure that belongs to faith that we can measure things by in the scripture. The second thing that I want to say uh, <clears throat> as far as the head communicating and leading the body, is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is, he's the life giver from God. He is, the Holy Spirit is, he's that, that life of God that's breathed into Adam, right? The creation story is like a microcosm of the gospel, right? It's, it's God breathing into dead, uh, a dead clay body, breathing life into that body and that body comes to life and, and is a living soul right it's that creation story is my story it's your story it's God breathing life into us it's the story of this church that collectively works here in this area it, it's our story it's God breathing life into his body he's God with us and he gives life to the body in John now first John chapter 2 John makes a a statement that's kind of enigmatic, no surprise, it's John, right? <clears throat> but as he's saying about abiding in Christ and letting the truth abide in you and that which is from the beginning abide in you, he makes this statement, verse 27 of chapter 2. He said, but the anointing, the anointing which you receive from him abides in you. And you do not need that anyone teach you but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. So there's a, there's a, a, a role that the Holy Spirit plays. There's a role that the anointing plays. And it's not saying that we don't need teaching. God gives the body teaching. But it's saying that the ultimate standard is not a human teacher. The ultimate standard is the Spirit of God that's bringing words of life and words through Amen. the teachers, right? But, that, but that's also subject to the standard of measurement that we talk about, right? Because John, the same John in the same letter says, try the spirits, whether they be from God, because there's other spirits. So there's a measurement that we also measure things by, but we also know that the Spirit is bringing enlightenment and the Spirit, the Spirit is bringing instruction. And as when, we, when Jesus came to Nicodemus, I'm sorry, when Nicodemus came to Jesus, and he begins, you know, well, we know that you're a teacher sent from God and, and no man can do the signs that you do except God be with them. Jesus just cuts right to the chase and said, you know what? You can't play. In a sense, you, you can't play. You don't have no part in this. What? I'm a, a ruler of Israel. You know, I'm coming. Jesus said, unless you are born again, unless you have received 
a spiritual birth. You don't really even have the faculties to function in what I'm doing. You need something supernatural to even participate in what I'm doing. So let's not waste time talking about what you think about where I came from. Let's get right to the matter. The matter is, is you have, you, you're lacking the essential faculties to even know what's going on in the kingdom of God. You need a spiritual rebirth. You need the Holy Spirit. The Spirit supplies gifts to the body. The Spirit supplies faculty, spiritual faculties by which we navigate a spiritual kingdom. And he supplies gifts within the body. Romans chapter 12, we talked about Romans not too long ago, but in Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through 8, he said, I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another, having then gifts. Well, where do we get those? We got them from God. That the, every, every person in Christ, every person in this room and every person in this world that's in Christ has been given abilities and talents and gifts and things that, that, that God wants to work within you to make the body function so that the body can be effective. That's how we receive from our head, as we receive the gifts that he gives us. And so he says, <clears throat> having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. If ministry, let us use it in our ministry. He who teaches in teaching, exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Peter says virtually the same thing in chapter 4 of 1 Peter, uh, verses 10 and 11. <clears throat> he says, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies. Why? That in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. I like what Peter says. Amen. Amen. In Acts chapter 13, we find <clears throat> the church at Antioch. It's a relatively new church, and we've covered this pretty recently also, but it's a relatively new church. There's, <clears throat> there's leadership there. There's brothers and sisters there that are fired up, and they're praying and fasting and ministering to God, and the Holy Spirit speaks. And the Holy Spirit speaks and says, separate for me Barnabas and Saul to the work that I have given them. So they, they're obedient to that. The Holy Spirit has spoken. We don't know exactly how, but there's prophets there. There's, there's people, we don't know how he communicated, but he did. The Holy Spirit communicated to the church. Jesus communicated to the church through the Spirit. It's time for Barnabas and Saul to go on a missionary journey. So as, I'm just saying that as we take this and apply it to ourselves, as we look at our situation, are we seeking what the Holy Spirit wants us to do? Are we seeking some kind of direction, revelation from him as to what, what do we do right now? What, what do we, what does God want us to do? What does Jesus want this body in particular to do? Uh, the, next, the last one, is opportunities. And I'll just, I'll, I'll refer you, going back one step, to the council at Jerusalem in Acts 15 as a good result of how the Holy Spirit speaks, and sometimes it's messy. The, the council at Jerusalem 
you would expect with apostles on earth and, and the Spirit speaking directly and all of that, you'd expect that you could just walk up to a little booth and say, okay, circumcision question. We need some answers. And some apostles back there would go, here's the inspired answer. You go, thank you. And you go, and this problem solved. But they didn't. They got it. There was yelling and debate and all kinds of stuff going on. And it finally boiled down to some good leadership and some direction. And they finally came away with an answer from the Holy Spirit. But it was a, a collective body discovery. But once they discovered it, they knew it was being led. They knew that's what God's answer was. So I think we have to learn something from that. You know, that, that we have to expect sometimes that it's a growing, discovering, and we might not all agree all the time, but we have to hear each other. We have to let God sort it out and then make decisions about, okay, what are we going to do with this? How are we going to move forward? Measuring it by God's word, seeking his, his direction in prayer and fasting, and then say, we, want, we need to move on. What, we want to sense the leading and the direction of what God has for us. So lastly, opportunities. And I think as we, this is the part where we take it out and start putting it into practice and we see what God does with it, right? They go on the missionary journey that the Holy Spirit said, it's time for you guys to go. So they go on that journey. And one of the first things they're doing is they're sitting in a synagogue in Antioch of Pisidia. And here's what happens. And the ruler of the synagogue comes and says, you guys have anything you want to share with the group? These guys have just been called on a missionary journey to preach Jesus to the Gentile world. They're sitting in a synagogue, and somebody comes up to him and says, by the way, you got anything you want to share? <coughs> really? Boom. You know, there's a, there, God just, was that Jesus leading Paul to stand up and teach in the synagogue? Absolutely. And it came by way of this opportunity that just opened up right before him, right? And we see that going on. We've been talking a lot about that as we've studied through Acts. It's God leading his church through opportunity. We see that, hey, you're not allowed to go up north to Bithynia. Okay, we'll go down to Asia then. No, not allowed to go to Asia. Okay, we'll keep going straight. Oh, we get this. Paul has this vision. Come over and help us. Macedonia. Opportunities. Opportunities that come up. And so I think just kind of in a conclusion that as we, as we have in Scripture, we have a clear understanding of the overall purpose of God. We see the richness of the story of God and how it comes to us today. We have the spiritual measuring tool by which we can try the spirits and see how do they line up with scripture? How does the teachings line up? How does our ideas, our direction, the things that we might be thinking of would be a good idea, how does it line up? They also have their spiritual senses exercised by reason of use, right? Hebrews 5. Exercised by reason of use. We're putting things into practice. We're getting spiritual exercise. We're seeking Jesus' will in our prayers, in our fasting, and we're willing to take it out and see what God does with it. And God will open opportunities. He'll provide. We'll, we'll sense his lead by what opens up for us to do, what opens up for us to get done. So these are just some things that, that I want us to be thinking about. I just wanted to share. This is <clears throat> things that I've been thinking about, wanting to share these things with you. And so stay immersed in God's word. Surrender yourself and seek the fullness of his spirit to provide power, enlightenment, and then look for your opportunities to just present Jesus. Just go out and with a willingness to live Jesus Christ and see what God does. With you. He won't waste it. He won't waste it. He'll put us all in places where we can serve him. And I think that's how God, that's how we can say we are a church under the leadership of Christ. How does he do it? I think this is kind of a, uh, at least a foundational thing to think about. There's probably so much more that could be said. But my enemy up there on the wall, when I look over that way and say my enemy, I'm not looking at Rick. <laughs> it's my, my two-handed enemy up there. 
I just wanted to leave you with that. So let's close with a word of prayer. And again, I appreciate your attention and this opportunity to share with you. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this group. Thank you for bringing us where we are today, Father. And thank you, God, for what you're going to do with us in the future as we seek you, as we ask, seek, and knock, and try to present ourselves as those exercised by reason of use, those who are growing in spirit, those who are willing to be tools and, and implements in your hands to continue the work that Jesus began. Actually, Jesus was the climactic point of your eternal purpose, God, and from there on we get to be a part of a glorious story, and we thank you for the privilege. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.